Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 135. This episode is with my new friend Chris Prynoski, who is the president and creator of Titmouse Animation. You might have heard of it. He's also hilarious and such a good hang. Man, I had such a blast chatting with him. Uh, you'll also hear a third voice in the beginning for a bit. That's Heather, and she is amazing. But Chris and I talked about him being from Trenton, New Jersey originally, and then going to the School of Visual Arts in New York, and some pretty insane stories about how that was. <laughs> uh, we talked about how he almost became an architect before realizing what that job actually entails. We talked about how Titmouse technically started out as a t-shirt company, and then they moved into a TV repair shop and eventually got their big break with Metalocalypse. Yeah, that Metalocalypse. Uh, Chris breaks down the process of directing a cartoon, which I had no idea about. Fascinating stuff. Uh, he talked about what a board revisionist is, which is a job that sounds almost as difficult as pronouncing the word revisionist. I anyway, it's crazy. And uh, we talk about how studios choose what projects they work on. Um, he also gives some great advice for up-and-coming artists. It was just so fun. Chris is the best. But uh, I'm going to stop talking and let you listen for yourself. So without further ado, please enjoy the interesting podcast episode number 135 with Chris Prynoski. Theme song time. <laughs> How's your day going though? It's yours isn't over yet, so that's good. You still have time. Yeah, it's six thirty right now. We just had Taco Tuesday. My son's what? eight years old. He's very into tacos. There you go. We had my folks come over. They're they're out there having their post dinner conversation. Oh, the best. I was like, I gotta do I gotta do a podcast, but I'm full of tacos. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm on my second drink. So if so I you, get too sick, perfect. Don't know why. So you got you got my writer is what you're saying. I need my guests full of tacos and booze, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Well done. Tequila go together, so you know. That's right. That's right. I'm a, I'm a whiskey sour man, so I'm, I'm into it. I'm into it. And I, I love your hat. Tequila and water. Oh, great. This is. Yeah. I mean, and the water is in the form of an ice cube. There's not like water, water. Okay, cool, 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 cool. No, no dilution here, Chris. Come on, man. <laughs> this is authentic, you know. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's later here. I'm in Florida, so I'm I'm oh, okay. th I'm three hours ahead. I think you're in California. Gotcha. Yes. Yes, I'm in California right now. Yes. Right on, right on. Heather was in Portland. I don't know if you heard. I did, I did hear that. <laughs> I, I'm not moving around a lot right now. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. So you're, from what I know, probably not born in California. Uh, yes, I, you are correct. Uh, <laughs> born in New Jersey, Trenton, New Jersey. Oh, oh there you go. Well, if you're from Trenton, New Jersey, you pronounce it Trenton, New Jersey. Of course, of course. Yeah. And right. then I lived there. And then when I was 18, I went to the School of Visual Arts in New York, but I still hey. lived in Jersey City, New Jersey, which is... There you go. Almost as bad of an armpit of the world as Trenton. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> then, it's the, then it's the Skype of Jersey. <laughs> I lived in Brooklyn for a while and then moved out to California. There you go. There you go. Not bad. <laughs> uh, they were semi-close and then not at all. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. So you went to visual arts school. That's So were you drawing growing it, up? Yeah, I always liked to draw pictures, you know. Yeah. It, was, it was fun drawing pictures and stuff and you know, it's, it's, I had a friend, uh, my friend Jack, who was like, uh, you know, we, he, I was an only child by uh, biology. I ended up having a bunch of stepsisters and stepbrothers later on go. in life. Same. But when I was a kid, me, uh, my, my best friend was this guy, Jack Alvino, who our, our mothers were friends. And they put us, we were born like close together. So they're like, these kids will be friends. And then they end, <laughs> they end up being like my best friend. That's how it works, right? When there you go. Kid, there you go. There. But he, we used to, he, he got a, because uh, all our folks were divorced and his dad would buy him a bunch of cool shit because he oh, had uh, guilt from being divorced. <laughs> and got him a video camera 
before uh, before video cameras were really popular and it sure. was like well, we had a video camera and he sh would shoot video we'd make these dumb videos and he's like hey i'm gonna go to nyu for film school and he was a year ahead of me in school and i was like oh man he could do shit like that and i was like i could draw <laughs> and i like making movies maybe animation is like a thing that is you know combines those two yeah. things of like making making little films and, and drawing pictures because i thought i i thought i wanted to be an architect right and then okay That's i drawing. ended up being like a, I guess like what you call it's like pseudo like a paid intern or or a gopher or like a pa for this architect's office and then i realized i, didn't, I really didn't want to be an architect because only <laughs> like the one percent of one percent gets to design cool shit like design the guggenheim and stuff and mostly you're putting you ever see like the 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 real housewives of any of these cities uh, the real housewives. Uh, I, I mean that was like every yes. one of this guy's clients and they oh. were all just like it was just making wow. a, a, a new kitchen for some like real housewife <laughs> and i was like man this doesn't sound like the life for me <laughs> i don't i'm tired of drawing windows <laughs> yeah <laughs> My, oh, my son just, that, that slamming of the door was my son coming in and out. What do you want to say, buddy? What? Hey, buddy. the last one to come. Okay. Well, say hi. hi. I'm, in, I'm in the middle of hi. an interview. What's hi, buddy. What's the interview about? Tacos. Yeah, that's, a good, that's a good question. Tacos. It's about tacos. Wait, are you serious? Yeah. Do you like tacos? You had them. Wait, the, this interview is about tacos? Yeah, it's about how many can you eat, like in one sitting. I can eat one time. I eat eight. Whoa! <laughs> Good lord! That's amazing. Your dad could only eat five. <laughs> yeah, I, know. I, didn't, I didn't mean to throw you under. Know, you know what? Five funny. is exactly the amount of tacos I ate tonight. I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I really that was only one time. That's yeah. all. That's all it needs. World records yeah, only need to happen once. That's exactly. it. Then you're that's in the true. book. Yeah. So I respect that. Eight is a eight is a strong number. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's a good number. I wouldn't eat against you. <laughs> All right, buddy. Bye, bye. All right, bye. Thanks for stopping by. Nice meeting you. <laughs> <laughs> You're raising them right. They like tacos. Yeah. They eight of them. Chris, yeah. <laughs> killing it. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. I love that. It's That's actually really interesting because I think about architects and yeah the first thing that comes to mind is like oh you get to do cool like laboratories you get to do crazy yeah. buildings but then you're like but not really the average the most of it was he had like three types of clients one was like you know kind of like rich you know people who wanted their kitchen redone and you know they, they were always the most demanding and then there was like hey a restaurant needs to be like redone and they'd put in like new make it look cooler you know or there'd be like an apartment building needs to be like refaced and you go in and I would do that with the draftsman. Like I oh. was, that would be our job. The draftsman and I would go out and we, at the time it was all like straight up, just like the metal measuring tapes and you'd measure every wall and every nook and cranny of the building. Oh, no. And then they'd bring it back and they'd have to redraw the plans. Cause no building, what I learned is no building is what the plans the last set of plans says it is <laughs> like no but no building stays the same it's like these plans are from 1942 and it's right. like no, that building's not going to be the same as those plans <laughs> nope nope <laughs> it's drawn on a tablet like a small yeah. tablet yeah, yeah. this is weird that was it was like the early days of computers like computer architect stuff too like Sure. Remember, I was like, "Whoa, you could draw on a computer." It was pretty. Oh yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's like fake drawing, but real drawing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. So, were you into cartoons? Like, what were you drawing? Yeah, yeah, I would like to draw cartoons. I was really. In, I had some book on like cartooning that I somehow somehow made into my possession when I was a little kid, and I would always like uh, like copy the cartoon drawings and that. You know, it was just fun to draw cartoons. And then when I was in, like, probably, like, junior high, high school, I realized, like, you know, there was a time when I'm, I I abandoned my true self of, like, a Dungeons & Dragons playing nerd. Like, mm. around when I was in, like, seventh grade, I was like, I better learn how to, like, ride a skateboard or, or something. <laughs> I a so a I went on that, that journey for, like, five years, and I went straight back to being a nerd again. But I realized the way to be cool was, like, to – 
you know, be able to paint, like draw cartoon characters of people or paint like a demon on the back of somebody's jean jacket or something. Yeah, you know? there you go. Stuff like that, you know. It's funny how that Customize works, isn't it? these vans, you know, yeah. their vans. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you there know? you go. There you go. Like, That's your end. Little cottage industry be like, five dollars a side <laughs> four sides on, two pairs of shoes two sides on each there you go 20 bucks <laughs> do it for these bands there's, there's that architect math you're measuring the sides. Yeah, yeah, okay yeah. okay it's gonna be this by this yeah, yeah, <laughs> just yeah. scale it down to a shoe surface yeah I respect that. I respect that. <laughs> it's funny how that works though, isn't it? Like for, uh, as a fellow nerd myself, where like yeah. you can try to hide it, but it's not going to last. It's just going to come out. You yeah, know, it's true. you're it's like, true. I, maybe you're just <laughs> wired this way. And then I'm like, I check this out. I'm totally not this person. But after a while, you're like, what's, <laughs> yeah. I'm putting it up on the wall. I'm just going to do yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, cool. that. well, if you go to art school, then you realize, like, oh, all bets are off. You know, sure. You know? <laughs> was that so? Then how was that going to like? Because there's a difference between doing something like for a hobby because you love it, and then going to school for it because then it yeah. comes into work. You know what I mean? It's weird. it's a you know art school is a real pe weirdo particular kind of situation. Like I went to public school up until I was in eighth grade, and then when I was in high school, I actually went to Catholic school. Because oh, cool. my folks were like, the public high school is too fucked up. Like, yeah. don't go there. <laughs> Can't, confirm. Can't confirm. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so Catholic school was a big adjustment, you know. Sure. And then going from Catholic school to art school was a crazy, oh, yeah. you know, a huge difference. Because I, I was always in detention in Catholic <laughs> school for having, like, not shaving or wearing sneakers or things like oh, that that are really wouldn't be bands. considered offenses at a normal school. So sure. <laughs> at our school, they're like, yeah, what a, you can do whatever you want, you know, to the, 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 there's nothing you can't do really. We can talk about whatever on this yeah. podcast, right? Is oh, there yeah, any, totally. any restrictions of types of things? Nope. So I was dating this girl. Is the kind of things you can do in our school. She was uh, in the sculpture department. And the sculpture, but a lot of the performance art type people would uh, would uh, like go to sculpture because it was like the least. I think there were the least like restrictions on what they would consider art or or whatever. Nice. And this one dude in her class, I went to like the end of the semester show, and they're all going to show off their art. And the sculpture building was in this old building. Man, it must have been like a hundred years old. And, like uh, you know. Like maybe like, where was that sculpture? Around? Like 16th Street on the west side. And it had this gigantic pillar. And it had a probably like 30-foot ceiling in the lobby with this gigantic pillar in the middle of it that was probably like, you know, as, as wide as a man is tall, right? Cool. And this guy's art project was um, he hooked up like mountain climbing gear to the pole and oiled down the pole and himself and got uh, naked and uh, used the mountain climb gear to climb to the top of the pole, and he masturbated on it and finished. <laughs> and that was his, that was school. That's school. <laughs> school. <laughs> college, even college. That's art, Chris. That's what we yeah, call yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were, the pendulum swung the other way. <laughs> You're like, wow, I, I've. I have to change a lot of things about my portfolio. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> that is. Hard. You don't need to do do that to get a job in that. Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, you, don't, well, you don't have to say it. You don't have to say it. <laughs> yeah, I, I got your back on this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that stuff that comes out later on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's funny. So then, did you did you graduate from art school with the same love of art that you went into it with? Yeah, because I think, you know, SVA is a real interesting school. You know, it was uh, it was initially founded as a trade school, right? It was founded oh, cool. by a bunch of illustrators like, yeah, I think Norman Rockwell might have been one of the what? founders. Like a lot of these I've older, of like kind of like early mid-century artists, um, Bern Hogarth, oh, dude. maybe Andrew Loomis. A lot of these guys who were like real technical, technical illustrators and they're like, there's no real school to teach you how to get a job in commercial art these art schools are all about yeah. basically that that performance that i saw <laughs> you know? they're like they're just about like weird you know whatever art can be anything and it's like 
we sure. want to found a school that teaches people real skills and art. So it always kind of functioned to me, at least in the animation department and the film department, which was like a, animation was a subset of the film department. I always felt like kind of a, like a trade school almost, even though we got a, ended up with a college degree. I don't know how, because any of my <laughs> academic classes are really easier than like elementary school. <laughs> they sure, like they a, had to be. Yeah, of, be. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but yeah, it was good because at the time, there weren't as many fancy computers and having access to the gear. Like I had a bunch of like hippie beatnik kind of teachers that were just like, man, just do whatever you want. And if you were motivated to try and fuck around with stuff, you could really learn a lot by just like trying shit out and doing it sure. and, failing and then trying again. And that, that, that was good. And there was a kind of culture of like a few other students and I, students and I that would like stay late or pull all nighters most of the week and, you know, just make cartoons all the time. It, it was, it was a good time. A lot of those guys I still work with, they're all in the animation industry, you know, and even ones you'd eventually run into one who's like a couple years younger than you in another class. But then the guy, it's like, Oh, the guy I see here every night. And then those are the guys you see working. You know, those yeah. are the guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of course, of course. <laughs> That's yeah. cool. That's so neat to have like teachers that kind of allow you that creativity to fail because you don't hear that a lot. It can get so yeah, yeah. Like, do it right. It's you know, probably what I mean? a little bit different now. I don't know, but it, it's also, I mean, I gotta say, I I loved going to that school, but the you know a lot of these schools, you know, they're they're it's a business. You know, it's a profit yeah driven business. So if you if you're too harsh on your students, I hear this a lot from my academic friends. Uh, just across the board who've been teaching for a long time and much more you know much more in the world of like academia than an art school is like there's a kind of unwritten but very real pressure to give people better grades than they would have gotten like ah, 10 sense. or 20 years ago because it's like if people fail they don't pay their tuition if they yeah. get a <laughs> <they do. laughs> so you know that's i don't good, know what that's, that's good that's point for preparing people for society but SBA was very much that, like kind of like, hey, do do what you want. If you make a film, if you fit, if you somehow get through this, you're gonna, you're gonna get an A, you know. Sure. <laughs> you just have like, to survive. It's, it's like, it was kind of like a pass fail almost. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, finish your film. And sure. That's the, you know. There you and go. then animation at the time it wasn't as popular as it is now. I think in my because animation started. There wasn't a, a beginner year. You had to be in film or illustration in your first year. And then second year, you started animation. I think there was like 20-something, maybe close to 30 people in that year. And then by the time our graduating class, there was just seven of us Ooh. left. <laughs> so like, wow. A bunch of people dropped out because Ooh. animation is very tedious. It does, yeah. It's not like uh, – you, uh, you ever see one of these shows uh, called The Simpsons? You ever uh, hear this I'm, one, The maybe? Simpsons? That's the fish. That's the fish one, right? It's about fish. There's a, yeah, yeah. There's an episode of The Simpsons where they they're like going to visit Mad Magazine or something, and then they go and it's just a boring office, and they're yep. like, what the hell? you know. I mean, I think there was a joke where they didn't go in back in a secret room where all the crazy shit's happening. Yeah. But I think like just like Bart and Homer Simpson, they thought Mad Magazine was going to be some crazy wacky joke a minute like yeah. like funhouse. It's like. It's actually just a bunch of dudes slowly drawing a drawing table. <laughs> it's <not> super <laughs> boring to watch. That's what animation is. Everybody's got their headphones on, listening to their podcast. They're watching a Netflix show half-assedly in the background as they animate their scenes. There you, you, know? go. There you They're go. They're not talking to each other. They're not jumping up and down on trampolines with oh, uh, man. clown that's, outfits dude, on. That's why I wanted to talk to you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what did you know about yeah. the back room? <laughs> <laughs> Is it true that Titmouse started as a t-shirt company? It's it's technically true. Yeah. That's um, amazing. I mean, I've always worked in animation, you know, but I was sure. like kind of you know, I'd moved out I just moved out to LA from New York. It was the it was the year two thousand. Uh, and yes. uh, and uh, I was like, there was a lot of, that was like this first wave of like internet animation. There's like Icebox and, you know, yeah. uh, the, whatever the name. I can't remember. There was like four or five different like places you could watch. Adam Films. There was mm -hmm. these things where they're like, internet, it's going to be the thing. Yeah. But just like <laughs> the speed of the internet was not 
happening enough to really make this a thing. You know, you, I don't know if you remember, you had to like, I, I remember dial up to download forever. <laughs> and then it was like real choppy and as big as like an index card, if you're lucky, you know, mm-hmm. and then it just wasn't the thing, but I had a bunch of friends who got into it and even Shannon, my wife, she worked for one of the companies. Oh, right and, on. Uh, there was a, it was founded by, you know, a friend of mine who worked on Beavis and Butthead together at MTV, Ooh. founded this company. And then it was like, he took investment and then it's like, after a year, they just shut it down. And I was always like, how are you going to make money? He's like, I don't know. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> venture capitalists are giving us money. Maybe we'll sell a TV show to a TV network. And I'm like, isn't that the past? Like you're trying to do something. <laughs> but, Move on. And then, but they were like, or maybe we'll sell some merch. And that made me think, I was like, well, I have like, I could draw weird cartoon characters yeah. and we can make stupid cartoons. Cause I, I was just getting into flash, which they were starting to use at the sticky flicks. And I'm like, Oh, I see how this is. You can bang something out pretty quick. It just has to be funny. It doesn't have to have a lot of production value. So I was like, what if our site, and I always made films under the name Titmouse. I was like, I'll call it Titmouse. It's a dumb name, too dumb of a name for an animation <laughs> studio. That's for sure. You know, I was like, I'll call it Titmouse, and uh, we'll just make T-shirts. And instead of trying to make a, a website that's branded, we are a website about cartoons and entertainment, and then try to sell them T-shirts on the store tab. Yeah. You make it a website about T-shirts, and guess what? Some of the designs on these t-shirts, they made weird cartoons out of them. So it was like, it was just like the flip of it, right? So I was like convinced that this was going to work. And it was way harder to do like selling shit online back then. They didn't have like oh, these all shopping cart, Shopify, none of that shit existed. PayPal was pretty new. Had to get like a merchant account and all this, like someone to program wow. the website. You know, like it was much more, like it was much more official. It was like you had to start a real business and... We sold a fair amount of t I don't think we ever made money selling t-shirts. <laughs> Does anyone? It, just, it was a fun side project, and it was, you know, it was cool. I was working at the networks, directing cartoons and stuff. And then there you go. We, we got this one job. I was I was doing a lot of com- directing a lot of commercials and short stuff mm-hmm. as a freelancer. And then we just hired my friends. You know, you just pay with a check, and they're like, it's just, "I put this in my taxes." I was like, "I don't, I don't know, I don't yeah. know." I don't know. <laughs> I draw cartoons. Yeah. So. <laughs> We got this one, a, a friend of mine, Chris Brown, who was the head writer on Beavis and Butthead. He ended up being the head writer on the Tom Green show. So I don't know if you oh, know Tom Green. But, of course. Uh, yeah. So he was start. He was just starting this movie up called Freddy Got Fingered. And he was like, oh, hey, yes. they need an animator. He's going to play an animator. They want to do a little animation in the, in the middle. And they also need a guy to draw the drawings that are supposed to be his drawings. Right. So I met Tom Green, got hired. And uh you did started that? working on it and then uh yeah this this movie if you ever see freddie got fingers you get to i'll, I'll give oh, you yeah. a little side uh, side note on this i could say one of the proudest moments of my career is a uh, rip torn who plays uh tom green's dad actually jammed one of my drawings up his asshole what? uh in a scene to show how much disdain he had for Highlight. tom green's drawings <laughs> yeah so it's like who else could say that i think i'm probably the only one yeah. Right. You know, Zeus, that, that particular Zeus honor. Took a, took a drawing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but anyway, so I'm like, uh, uh, I didn't think it's a movie, right? With a movie, like a, it's a 20th Century Fox, and they call me, like they're lawyers and business affair, and they're like, hey, uh, what's your production company's name? Like for the contract. I'm like, I don't have a production company i'm just a dude and there was like <laughs> silence on the other end of the line like this long pause <laughs> and then they one of them says uh, do you have production insurance and i was like fuck i don't know what that means you know so i said, like, yeah i got insurance actually i do have a company the company's name tip mouse we have a real bank account and everything <laughs> because you know? I, I was the only company that i had and i just had to like grasp at straws and that was the first time that we did a an animation job through the company and uh it ended up being way better for like taxes and shit i'm not like sure you know, it's their way that it works where it's like oh yeah there's a we don't have it's not weird you just cut a check to your friend through the company instead of a personal check and you don't end up with yeah. any problems at the end of the year. <laughs> and then we just started doing more jobs out of Titmouse. I think we did like the opening to the Osbournes right after that and some what? other 
stuff like di- different like weirdo small jobs a lot of music videos and sure pilots and commercials and then eventually you ever you ever uh, read this book i didn't know anything about business right so i i was directing a show at cartoon network and i was like an ep on the show so it's like i was like oh, really wow. in charge of it and yeah it's like my wife was like, you got to quit your job at Cartoon Network and focus on tip I'm like, are you crazy? This Cartoon Network job is like how we make money. And she was like, if you quit your job at Cartoon Network and focus on this, this will be your job. So she was the one who really had the vision and convinced me to do it. <laughs> so I remember I was shaking. I had to tell the, the executive that I was quitting and we were still halfway through the second season. But then he told me, he's like, hey, I'm not supposed to tell you this. This show is getting canceled anyway, so it's probably a good time to split. So I was like, all right, thanks, man. That and helps. Yes. That helps yeah. a lot. <laughs> yeah. But um, anyway, the, the, this is a long lead up to uh, I start I we start running this business. And I realized I don't know anything about business. I went to art school. So I, <laughs> I, read, I started buying these like essentially like business for dummies books. I read these two books by this guy, Robert Koyasaki. Oh, I, I think he's some like kind of like crazy internet guy i think he went bananas or something on the internet recently but back then they all did. it really helped me understand there was one called rich dad poor dad and one called cash flow quadrant and uh <laughs> it just helped me understand like oh that's an asset and that's a liability uh-huh. and uh we were we kept bidding on jobs at that time we would get pilots but we'd never get tv series because we're in a storefront we're in this little it used to be a tv repair shop and it was just oh, like a long cool thing. we had a couple offices that looked like weird hollywood private eye offices upstairs yeah. People come by and i could just tell on the clients faces it's like well we can't give them a tv series they're in a tv repair <laughs> shop you know, but they were like, we could have rented space you know so i was sure. like you know we've got to get into a bigger we got to get into like a professional looking studio and i was like this is hollywood this is just my hunch I was like, once we're in a professional looking studio, they'll take us seriously and we'll get one of these series, right? So I read in this Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or I think it was Cash Flow Quadrant, the difference between the asset and the liability. And uh, I was like, we got to buy a building because otherwise it's a liability. And our accountant was like, you can't fucking afford to buy a <laughs> Are you crazy? And I was like, no, look, we have enough for like, because with this, with the, the small business association, you can put 5% down, right? So I was there like, you go. We cover the 5% and then we have enough money in the bank, everything we own for two months after we put that down payment. And he's like, yeah, exactly. You, you can't uh, buy a building. And I'm like, fuck it. We're doing it. Cause yeah. I was too dumb. I know that it was a bad <laughs> idea. Get and it. the bank was like, what is your business plan? And I was like, I don't know. So I downloaded a business plan off the internet and just put, just put <laughs> fake numbers in it and sent it back. And I'm like, what are you basing these numbers on? And I was like, well, they're like, how does your business work? And I was like, well, we just make cool cartoons Done. and hope people see them and then ask <laughs> us to make more cool cartoons. And they're like, that doesn't, they like, that's not going to make the bank feel comfortable about giving you a loan. Right. So Fair. I was like, All right, what? I knew that the banks were like into, they're always into like Hollywood type shit, you know? So I was like, all right, work for all these clients. So it was still back in the days when people still had company letterhead and I got like 10 different, the highest person I knew at like Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network and Disney and MTV, whatever the cool networks were at the time to write me letters that said like, Hey, we work with this company. We're going to continue to work with them in the future. They're Smart. a great company and just put that like, this is my business plan. And they're like, All right, that checks out. That's cool. You know? sure. Nickelodeon. And we got that building and luckily we got the first show that we got fell through. It was this one for MTV that, that never, we never ended up doing. And then what was lucky is we ended up doing a show called Metalocalypse right after that. And I that was the one, that was the good one because I was already involved like the three key players, the two creators and the guy that they were getting to direct, I all knew actually John Schnepp, who, who actually mm-hmm. passed away a couple of years yeah. ago, a great friend of mine. Uh, he rented space in our place in the TV repair shop before oh, we cool. even, like it was kind of a part of Tim Mouse, even before, before we started making metal Ocus. and and Brendan, we were working on a cartoon pitch for sci-fi channel that didn't happen at the time. And Tommy, I knew as a punch up comedian who would just come in and he was like one of the funniest guys I ever knew. So, they had offered us, uh, uh, they were like, hey, Metal Ocalypse. I'm like, that one seems really funny. And I also know everybody. And they were like, 
this one cut called Minara Team, and they were like, they already have all their artists, and I was like, I don't know about that one. We want to establish the look of it, and then they were like, and the Boondocks just started, but it's in trouble. We need someone to help it bail it out. I'm like, that sounds like a bad first job to do. <laughs> to be like someone as a new studio trying to bail out a show that's in trouble sounds like sure. uh, a bad idea. So we chose Metal Octopus, and that ended up being the right decision. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. good choice. Good choice. <laughs> yeah. That was like my middle school year. Adult Swim was my entire like middle school. I was like, this right is the craziest craziest stuff ever was it like two in the morning and you're like why yeah. why am i awake at this time and is that venture bros like every, yeah everything i love it <laughs> you, so you mentioned you bid for shows how does it how does that work like, how, well it depends you know some shows we pitch and so like well, there's kind of like three ways to get work one is to like entirely develop something yourself and take mm -hmm. it out to market um, the opposite of the spectrum is just get hired as a work for hire. A network buys a show from a writer or a comedian or somebody who is not a cartoon studio or doesn't know how to make cartoons. They're like, can you help them make this cartoon? Mm -hmm. Or the middle ground is some kind of partnership where you, you team up oh. with a comedian or a writer or something, come up with an idea together. And then hopefully that gets it made into a TV show or a movie or something. So sure. those are big. The, the broadest possible categories. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, though. That's neat. So, Because you come from our school, you go out to L.A. Do you remember your first, like, animation gig where you're like, oh, I'm actually doing the thing yeah. that I came out here to do? I think I was doing two things. I got ripped. Luckily, the producer from Beavis and Butthead ended up moving out to L.A. before I did. I oh, got sweet. a job as the creative director of the commercials division of Klasky Chupo. So I don't know if you know, they did the Rugrats and the Wild yeah. Thornberries, Jumanji, a lot of shows in that zone, but they had a really thriving commercials division. So I got repped because so I think I had directed one commercial at MTV and they hired me as a commercials director. So I was doing a lot of commercial directing when I first got to LA. And then my first day job was like um, directing a pilot for Nickelodeon because I knew the development people and they're looking for a director for this pilot this is for an artist called dave fremont who i really liked really liked that pilot never got picked up uh he had done one of those early internet cartoons it was for wild brain this oh. early internet cartoon was called glue if you ever get a chance Ooh. to watch glue it's i really like it it's probably i mean it, it, once something goes on the internet it never yeah. escape the internet right it's probably up there somewhere it's somewhere forever. It's somehow, you know? <laughs> but glue and ponch was one of my favorite characters ponch was this kind of like motorcycle riding like evil Knievel kind of like oh, asshole kind of like matthew mcconaughey's character from days of Confused, <laughs> the kind of guy all the little kids advised him but the adults like thought yep. he was a kind of yep. weirdo and they all stay the same quiet. Where there's one of the kids is yelling out to Ponch, and he's like, "Hey, Ponch, do you prefer your hamburger sear sizzled or flame broiled?" And Ponch is like, "Flame broiled." <laughs> and he like, he out and they're like, "There goes Ponch. Everybody loves Ponch." <laughs> made an impression on me. I really like glue. Gold. <laughs> Punch. That, he loves playing broiled. That's I mean, I respect that. I respect that. You gotta you gotta respect someone who knows what they're doing. You know? Yeah. Yeah, a helmet, yeah, a cool helmet. Yeah. Punch. That's so yeah. cool. And it's interesting to have like the business side of your brain too, because I mean Titmouse is it's Titmouse now. And we tried. went you know, Shannon, my wife really dug into the business side. She controls a lot more of that than I do. Take hey, um that I get to not deal with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the key, right? You just got to find someone else that's better at it. Yeah. You know? It's tough. It is. It, I've learned that so many times. I've, that's every person we've hired or not only I've found accidentally, I don't know how this happened, mm -hmm. but all our key like officers in the company. Now we have like four different officers besides myself and Shannon are all people who not only they're like the opposite of yes men. They not oh, only are not afraid to tell me the truth or any time I'm fucking up, but they seem to love it. They seem to love <laughs> to tell me that I'm fucking up. <laughs> but it's good because I never am. I never worry about like, you know, a situation where uh, 
you know, the emperor has no clothes or whatever. Sure. You know? That's what you want. got. You're fucking naked and dirty. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're like two steps away from like climbing up a column naked. And they're like, we don't, yeah, yeah, need, yeah. <laughs> we don't need you doing that. We just bought a building, Chris. Let's yeah, not, yeah. not ruin yeah. it now. <laughs> That's crazy. So it, so there's like a studio. Break this down. I'm going to ask dumb questions because I just don't know. Sure. There's a studio yeah. of artists. And then yeah. you get a gig. And then you're like, hey, guys, we're making this show. Let's divvy up the work. And then you pass yeah. it. That you know, awesome. now, now it used to be a lot more like that. Now that we've grown in scale over the years, right there's a lot more organization with different producers for different shows. And we've got, you know, we've got, well, now with COVID, the locations don't matter as much because you could be sure. anywhere. But we, we technically have like our Hollywood studio and a Burbank studio, which is right over the hill. And then we have a New York studio and a Vancouver studio. So between right those, the work gets kind of split up. And then a lot of work still, you know, even with, I think we have the last, like, time I heard about numbers, I think we have 900 employees now. It's insane. I can't even think about that. It's the people that are inside. And then there's a bunch of freelancers and overseas studios because it just takes a tremendous amount of people drawing pictures and make cartoons. It's just, it's still, like, computers have helped. But then what happens is, like, if we were still trying to make a cartoon that looked like a cartoon from the seventies or eighties, sure. then we'd be, then we'd have a lot less people, but computers help, but then the quality bar gets higher. So you still need the same yeah. amount of people. <laughs> have a cartoon, a way shittier look at cartoon from the past. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. That makes <laughs> sense. How, how do you direct a cartoon? Cause I well, understand the idea of, you know, film and TV and stuff, you have actors, but a cartoon, it's all drawn. Like you, you Yeah. Know. So it's different, you know, it's, it's, it, there's different aspects of it, right? I mean, the, the, the way that you would work with a, D, a DP is the way that you work with your storyboard artist, right? When oh. you're talking about the shots and the different things, we're going to start on this kind of shot and go to a close up here and, a, you know, whatever, we're going to do a dolly shot, here, whatever, you know, that language is similar. Um, and then there's like, with those, you know, with those storyboard artists. And then ultimately, depending on the type of show, the way that it used to work and still some of the shows work is on something called exposure sheets, where every frame of the film is broken down into a a line on this gigantic grid that represents every single frame of film in the, in the show or the movie. Right. And then you work with, with, when I was in New York, the directors would do their own sheet timing, but in LA there's a bigger infrastructure where you work with sheet timers, where you're like, people who've just spent years with like stopwatches thinking about like, is eight frames funny or are six frames funnier? You know, when you, wow. move your, you just, you, t- you know, you take the storyboard poses and you're like, wow, this would, you know, and all the lip sync is broken down to its different phonetic shapes on the exposure sheets too. So the animators know what mouth position to, to draw. Mm-hmm. And you're like, well, oh, it's, you know, it's funny if he's, he moves his head up slow and then nods it fast. So he's going to, it's going to take him 30 frames to move his head up, but only six to move him down and then add a blink at the end or a double blink or what, you know, there's, sure. it's just trying to figure out what's funny and put those instructions down. And then if you're lucky enough to be working with a crew in-house, an animation crew inside the studio, you don't have to do the exposure sheets. We do dailies with them and talk to them and act stuff out. And that guy that I talked yeah. to you about earlier for a second, the guy who passed away, John Schnapp, he was yeah. phenomenal at acting out his scenes. So funny and so good. Like I always love to be, be in the handouts with him. Uh, he's such a good, such he could have been as good a comedian or comedic actor as anybody out there. Um, and then, but then times when you're sending stuff overseas, you really have to nail it down to like the exact specifics down to the frame of how you want stuff to be timed or else, because it's like a business transaction, right? And how do you account Mm -hmm. for creativity, right? You can't tell them to do whatever they, because if you don't like it, they're not going to do it again for free. So you have to like really spell it out. It's kind of like a contract in a way, a creativity contract of like, yeah, these instructions and you'll get paid. (laughs) <laughs> and everyone will be happy. You know? <laughs> so there's that. And then there's also directing the actors, you know, they're, so they're, they're voice oh, yeah. actors. Yeah, you're right. And you talk to them, you sit on the other side of the glass of a booth and they do their performance and you say, hey, what, what about if you do it like this? This hit this word, maybe try hitting this word, or maybe, uh, you know, this is the 
think about you're really scared or you know whatever any directing tips or what you shouldn't do it's it's frowned upon in the industry is to give someone a line read, line read to, yep. the line the way that you, you want it to be read although some actors will be or be you know we work with um he's a great comedic uh voice actor a great actor across the board is mark hamill oh, does yeah. so many so I've much voiceover the first first couple of times i worked with him he gives this speech you know i've seen him on on a first day of recording of every show he's like hey i'm not precious you want to give me a line read give me a line read you want to tell me to do something over i'll do it over whatever oh, gets cool. us out of here and into the parking lot faster hey he's got a system yeah. yeah i mean yeah. luke skywalker walks into your booth you're like you want to hear that that's yeah much, yeah yeah much better <laughs> he's, he's uh, yeah and for years you know, it's funny because I worked with them through the new Star Wars movies too. You know, it's like sure. you would always tell all these Star Wars stories and stuff, and everyone would gather around. He'd be like some, like the elder statesman, you know, yep. telling stories around the campfire or whatever. And then I, I remember when they were making that movie. I mean, obviously there were no secrets, but he had to, you know, it's Star Wars, right? Yeah. <laughs> they have lawyers, so he had to heavily honor whatever NDAs he was on, and he's like. Mm -hmm come in and he couldn't talk about anything but he would oh before the star wars stuff he was always on the craft service table and we'd be like hey mark you want anything he's like no he's like I'm not allowed to eat any craft service because of this contract i signed for this yeah. man you know and obviously we all knew what it was but uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing i know he, he did that me. i mean dude he's done everything he was the joker I mean, yeah. arguably the best Joker. And then he was Ozai in Avatar The Last Airbender, yeah. greatest animated show of all time, which you worked on. I did. Yeah, I worked in cool. multiple capacities on that. Yeah, Tim Mouse yeah. did the main title, but I also worked as like a kind of consultant uh, slash layout supervisor on the first season because Mike and Brian, I'd known both of them previously. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are just super busy and they needed someone to come in and kind of work with the crew and specifically the layout crew and just you know make the show happen because <laughs> <laughs> it was an unusual show at the time if you if sure. nowadays we could crew that show like nobody's business but back then there weren't a lot of like la like animation artists that were really good at drawing in a kind of like realistic anime style yeah and it was a lot harder to to do that and i had, i had learned to do that because like i was always as a kid I always liked anime stuff but i didn't know sure what it was like i'd be like i like these shows i don't know what they kind of look the same but i don't know why like it didn't it, I, sure it, didn't, like, it was I subconscious they were made in japan and it wasn't you know they were dubbed or whatever yeah so I was older. and then i got this job when i was in college there was this thing there was this big thing that maybe maybe you were into when you were a kid. I remember this company. They I had worked with them as an intern for I think the last season of Liquid Television when I was in college, cool. and then they were like, uh, "Hey, we're we're getting into this new thing." And I remember they put one on the table, like it was like it's yeah. like some kind of like scene <laughs> at like you know the Social Network or like yeah. Wall. It's the Wolf Wall Street or something. It's like it's called. CD ROMs and it's like that <laughs> the, 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 like eighties rock like soundtrack yeah. kicks and it zooms in and there's a glint on it and it's like so shiny and it's like, yeah. what, like a music C D. It's like, yeah, it's kinda like a music C D, but it's got tons of data on it. It's gonna revolutionize the computer industry. Yeah. Oh and I worked on like just doing animation for all these CD ROMs at the time. There you and then go. Was this anime one that was this one called Project ACO, which oh, I don't know sweet. if you are familiar with that, but um, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with, I don't know, I'm going to test your knowledge of like weird right. animation nerd shit. Go. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Studio Gynax. Uh, they're like, we're kind of responsible for this like really like radical shift in this, in this uh, like, you know, much more dynamic animation style than, than, than what was, uh, what was the current flavor and, and, and then other studios like Trigger and Science Haru have gone and run with that and made it a hundred times crazier, but they oh, were yeah. kind of the originators of the shit, but really 
it was this Project Echo that was all their inspiration. Uh, and that was like in probably early to mid '80s, and I was working on the CD-ROM in the mid '90s, and it was it was uh, a real education because I really had to learn how to draw in that anime style because it was oh, like yeah. super. I was working for these like super anime nerd guys that like they weren't going to tolerate it if it looked off <laughs> or something. So I really got an appreciation for the for that stuff. So when I by the time that I uh, got onto uh, Avatar, I was pretty versed in drawing in that style, which wasn't what go. I intended. Like, that wasn't my career goal, but it it worked out well. CD yeah. ROM, yeah, CD, the future. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, remember when internet came on CDs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can get an hour of Netscape at the yeah. post office. There would be like a there would be like an AOL online CD yeah. mail every single day, every oh, day. Oh yeah, they like didn't skip a beat. Uh huh. My dad stockpiled them, and then, <laughs> my, then my brother and I used them as no. like ninja stars. Yeah. <laughs> Our neighborhood is. I think it's still full of those CDs because we're like yeah. hey, throw them at each other. <laughs> <laughs> that that's a smart thing uh, i talked to shannon tyndall about that when he talks about being an animator that's like working in the industry it's important to know how to draw in different styles because oh, you can yeah. have your own style but like yeah. if you're working on avatar you need to know how yeah. to do an anime type of oh, style you do. you do luckily shannon's at the level now where he can draw on his own style. yeah right uh, yeah right <laughs> that's a good point beautiful, beautiful beautiful style you have there shannon if you're listening Agreed. Agreed. Your your doodles, I want prints of. Thanks. <laughs> but I, I yeah, I love yeah, talking to you. His latest stuff just got announced. I think his did that yeah. got announced, right? It, yeah, it okay. did. I didn't want to yeah. I don't, never want to be the guy spilling the beans. Yeah. That's okay. I edit these later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> yeah, I, I, I love hearing that because like that's something that I feel like isn't talked about enough. Is like if, be an artist. I think it's amazing to build up the skills, but also be adaptable to be more yeah. useful in the system. You know. Yeah, you just that's that's the thing. I, I mean, working in, you know, my early career was in New York. The first six years of my career, and I worked on a lot of commercials, which every commercial has a totally different style. As an animator, and then worked as a storyboard artist on TV shows. And I think it was a good, like, pretty well-rounded way to learn. It's yeah. a, not everybody gets opportunity to like kind of concurrently come up in two different disciplines at the same time. Usually it's like, well, I did this for a while and then I shifted gears and did this, but all my like nighttime freelance work was commercials and my day job was storyboards. So it was a good, good way to learn. I think. There you go. There you go. And specifically when I started in storyboards, I was what they call a storyboard revisionist, which is you don't actually do the stories. You just take, you sit with the director and he, yells and screams or she yells and screams and tells you everything that's <laughs> wrong with the storyboard artist's work and then you have to make all the changes because the storyboard artists are on to the next board right oh. they get paid a lot more money so they do all the initial drawings and then the revisionist goes and sits with the director and makes all the little all the little really? changes to be changed yeah yeah huh. it's uh it's a, that's i think the the best way to learn if you ultimately want to direct because all these people who are your heroes or the storyboard artists, they're the yeah. ones who are really doing it. You just see how the director shits on every, you, you get to learn <laughs> all their mistakes. And I, I do think like, it makes you a way better storyboard artist. And a lot of the people who are having their, their, their boards fixed all the time, never learn that stuff yeah. because <laughs> they didn't work as a board revisionist. You know? <laughs> I didn't even know that was a thing. What a, what a niche job. Yeah, it is. It's kind of like it's one of the. I think it's 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 weird because it's considered an entry level position as an artist. Really? But it's so difficult. Like yeah, it's one of the. It sounds like you have to be a wow. really good draftsman, arguably better than the board artist, because you're making the fixes. Yeah. Especially on stuff that might be shipped overseas, you have to be good at acting. You have to be good at comedy. You have to be good at like, essentially like listening and and enacting notes, like understanding yeah. what the note is and, and successfully executing it. It's a lot of disciplines that you cool. have to learn. And it's it's a it's a real trial by fire that, that gig. You know, people who could do that one I think are well positioned. Sure. To, but, <laughs> <laughs> is there a lot of turnaround in that job? We like ah, you got three shots, dude. Yeah, that right? one that one generally I, I find that that's that's a uh, that's like a bookend. 
to your oh. career. I find like storyboard artists will often start as a board revisionist and work as a board revisionist for two or three years, four years maybe, then have a whole career of like 20 years of storyboarding and then in kind of like the sunset of their career go back to being a board revisionist because oh. it's a much more technical job. You don't have to think, you don't have to be doing the storytelling. So it's like, I think once you have like, because that's a cool, weird thing about animation, you kind of get better and better as you get older, like in your there technical you skills because you do it all the time. <laughs> so like those guys, the guy who's been a board artist for 20 years, he, he revised storyboards in his sleep. You know? Sure, <laughs> sure. So I, yeah. Like, I wonder if Don Bluth has picked up anything over the years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We just started a new studio. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. How how has technology changed then from when you started to what you're doing now? I mean, it just gets better and faster yeah. and cheaper. Like it's go. great. I mean, but then that like I was saying before, the expectation gets gets higher. That's so true. but it's cool because we just challenge ourselves to make things fancier and better. So sure. when you look back at something you did five years ago and you're like, that's the best thing I ever made, then you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, keep that's true. Trying to make it better. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's a good point. It's a good metric. Yeah. <laughs> My best is in the past. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, love the, I love talking to animators as well who've worked on a bunch of different things because I think about like, you worked on Avatar, right? Which is a specific yeah. style, which a lot of people, it's so good people think it's like Japanese animation. They think uh, it's straight up anime. You're like, I mean, I, one day I'll show you all the little worksheets and rules I've made whoop. to make them, to fix <laughs> all the layouts and whatever. It's crazy. I mean, there's incredible artists on that show. I don't mean to take oh, any yeah. away from it. the very, the, the incredible specificity of drawing in the yeah. anime style. Because most of the people, because... Mike and Brian had been on King of the Hill, I think, right yep. before that. So most of the crew were people who were previously on King of the Hill, which is an, it's an incredibly different drawing style. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. True. But then <laughs> really also. Really trying to get them out of the King of the Hill posing style, which, you know, having worked on Beavis and Butthead and worked with Mike Judge, like he, say, doesn't yeah. like, he doesn't like, he likes people who stand straight up and down and deliver their lines and have right. good community timing but not a lot of like torsion in the poses not a lot of like sure you know crazy marvel comic book jack kirby style poses and a mike right. judge show, you know which avatar was all about that um mm -hmm. i remember referencing there's a book that i read as a kid it was called uh, how to draw comics the marvel way right oh, sweet and uh, there was this one page that i always i still reference to this day and it was like, you know, it was like, it doesn't matter how you, good you can, how well you can draw, right? It's all about, you know, the impact of an action comic book, right? Yeah. And they had this, right? And they had this little, Damn. this like range. And there was like, they're all drawn exceptionally well, but there were like a guy punching, right? And it would be like, you know, various versions of the pose where it was like weak, you know, better, okay, pretty good. And then like, Marvel and they like the, the Marvel <laughs> like the most extreme pushed pose, the most like as crazy a pose you could get. And like that's sure. what we had to do with Avatar. It's like, no, it's not Marvel enough. You gotta push it, you gotta <laughs> make it crazier. <laughs> there I do not want their spine to make sense. Go. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's amazing. I know you went from there and then I know you worked on Clone Wars, which is I did. Yeah, style. I did. Yeah, totally well, different. Dave Filoni, actually, there's a big connection there because Dave Filoni was directing on Avatar when mm -hmm. I was there. Mm -hmm. And we would go to lunch, and that's when all the prequels were, were, were in the process of coming out. Maybe the last one had just come out. I can't remember where we were on the time. But he would – we'd all shit on the prequels, and he would defend them. He'd be like, that's my dude. Great. They're still Star Wars. They're still great. Mm -hmm. And then I got a call. One of my friends got a job writing on Clone Wars, and he's like, hey, they're looking for a supervising director, dude, and I recommended you – you could be the supervising director on a Star Wars show. And I really had to examine myself because, like, if I told my, like, 12-year-old self, like, you could be the director of a Star Wars cartoon, <laughs> like, yeah, of course, what, like, do I even have to think about it? Sure. I remember sitting and thinking about it because Tim Mouse was just starting to pick up. I quit Cartoon Network, and Tim Mouse was just starting to become a thing. Mm -hmm. I was like, I have to abandon this, move up to, like, the Bay Area, 
right. and like give everything up and it, I'd be all Star Wars all the time. And I was like, man, I can't believe I'm saying this. I'm going to turn this down. I mean, I, they didn't offer me the job, but I turned down the interview. <laughs> sure. And then I was like, but I know the fucking guy who yeah. should have this job. And I recommended Dave Filoni, who had never been the supervising director on anything, but Dude. he's a great director. Oh, yeah. And and uh, he loves Star Wars like nobody's business. And I was yeah. like, this is the guy who should have the job. He, the guy who should have the job never gets the job. But True. he got it. He it did. Great. So then he's like, hey, why don't you come up to the – that's when they were still – they were still located on Skywalker Ranch. He's like, come on, for yep. a, come up for a month. Just bored. It'll be fun. It was fun. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. He was right. He was right. It was fun. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. You know, that Skywalker Ranch is nice. It's just yeah. as nice as you think it is. It is. I got to go. Last oh, well, you know them. <laughs> the drive there, you're like, this is another world. This isn't, yeah, ha- yeah. This isn't happening. <laughs> It's not yeah, happening. Yeah. And then you see the house and you're like, oh, it's still not happening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm dead, right? I'm definitely dead. Yeah. <laughs> but Floyd's done a phenomenal job and the man. Dude, that's the, that's the, that's the dude. I love that guy. Yeah. Everything he touches. I'm like, yes, please. I'll take it. That's the name I'm in. Totally. So then where- he was the most elaborate. Here's one thing. I don't know if people know this about him. most <laughs> elaborate cosplayer like before oh, cosplay yeah. was even a thing before there was even a word for it mm-hmm. i remember he made the best homemade mega godzilla that i've oh, ever seen and there was they, they did they, when they did a, a godzilla opening he went to the um to the premiere or to some event about godzilla and everyone just assumed he was part of the promotion and let him behind the red like behind the fucking <laughs> red rope and shit and people what? celebrities were taking pictures and shit with him because his mecha godzilla costumes just look so real they're like well clearly this guy is with the studio or something sure. he, uh, he, he basically snuck his way in in the most like not sneaking your way in yeah. possible <laughs> dress like, godzilla, like mecha godzilla and then he just let you in that's amazing. I knew he had like a Plo Koon Jedi Master that looks flawless. Oh, yeah. And you know he's the biggest Godzilla fan ever. That's yeah, so yeah. cool. <laughs> right yeah. on. So, okay, so Tip Mouse is happening around that time. Tip Mouse is now yeah. Tip Mouse. Do you, yeah. how do you go about like deciding what projects? You made Galaxy of Adventures. Which oh, yeah. That amazing. was fun. New Year's style. I was like, oh, it's nice. got to be Tip Mouse. It's got to be Tip Mouse. Right. And then I did, and I was like, Make yeah. more, please. But like, yeah, I really like that they gave us freedom of that because we did some before those that weren't as – like they, they just weren't as cool. I'm just going to say it. Sure. I mean, we did them. They're fine. But the Galaxy of Adventures I really love. Yeah. I think the ones we did before that were called Blips. They were oh, called yeah. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. Blip. Mm-hmm. yeah. They're fine. Like, yeah, there's they're nothing fine. Wrong. They're good. You know? But yeah, Galaxy, of, Galaxy Adventures. of Adventures, they really took the shackles off and let us do whatever we wanted. So that yeah. was great. I mean, it was really cool because they were basically like, hey, you know, the the gist of it was uh, a lot of these kids, they don't know the legacy, they don't know the lore of Star Wars, and there's a lot of movies to watch to get them on board. So why don't we just make bite-sized thing? And the the, the thing that was great is, you know, it's like it's just largely going to be audio from the movies. Like, So they would deliver the track. And then Barry Kelly, who was our director on the first first batch and, and, and maybe even into the second batch, um, like he was just bored whatever he wanted. You know, he's a huge yeah, Star Wars yeah. fan, so it worked out well, you know, but it's like, you know, he was so on point because he was doing what he loved, what he did. They're reimaginings of the classic scenes from yeah. all the Star Wars movies. It's great. Why, why, who wouldn't want to do that? <laughs> you know? Sure. Dream job, I mean, you know. Star Wars, but he loved it. So yeah. it was perfect for him. I love it. I and love I got to say, too, so he directed all those Star Wars Galaxy Adventures stuff. Mm-hmm. And right on the tail end, as he was wrapping up, he started directing on the Star Trek series. We're doing the Star oh, Trek Star Trek series. So yeah. I'm like, dude, you're the J.J. Abrams of animation. <laughs> you directed both Star Wars and Star Trek. Who could say that? Boom. Give it to him. Yeah. He's got it. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> what? So, what do you? How do you decide what projects Titmouse picks up? Because I imagine it's got to be. A we're, we're we're lucky. We're fortunate that we're in a position now where we don't have to take anything that comes around. So, right. 
you know, early on in our career, we take whatever, you know, you don't always put on your reel, but you take the job to keep the doors open. Now, yep. there's a lot of work for one, which is good. Mm-hmm. And we're in a fortunate position that we've, you know, established a reputation for doing quality work, I think. So, uh, I you know, we can choose a little bit more. And, you know, we usually pick on like a couple of different criteria. If we think it, you know, we can make it really funny, if it's something that can be funny or something that can be cool or really weird or, yeah. you know, something that we can really dig in and do something of like a really high production value, like get in and really animate it really well. I think those, so we don't really have a house style. We mm-hmm. have more of like what I would say is like a house sensibility, like something that's like, it's not as tangible as like, oh, the, all their cartoons look the same. There's just some kind right. of vibe that emanates from them, I guess. I don't know how to describe it. You know, it's, it's art, the thing that you identified with the <laughs> Galaxy of Adventures thing. Yeah, but, um, it's a feel. The, uh, so, you know, we'll do preschool shows. We'll do adult shows. We'll do Hell yeah. comedies. We'll do dramas. You know, we're doing a drama for AMC now. It's going to be crazy. It's like an oh, hour-long cool. drama. What? Yeah. So it's going to be cool. That's yeah. cool. I think it's been announced. It's called Pantheon. You can Ooh. look at it and see what's been announced. Pantheon. Do you have like a favorite? Is there stuff that comes out like a favorite type of project? Where you're like, ooh, ooh, yes, please. This. I mean, I really, I like so many different things. I'm trying to think of what my favorite is right now. It's tough. I really like Mau Mau. That's on ooh, cartoon. Ooh, yeah, Check great one. Out. That show, you know, Parker is an animator that's worked with us for years. He's, he's been an animator and he's been a storyboard artist, director, voice actor. And, you know, he made uh, that short uh, – for an event we do called five second day where we let people make whatever they want, you know, on that day. And then we show it in a movie theater. Oh, that's cool. No censorship. And then he kept developing it and they brought it to me and it's like, Hey, can, can we make a larger short and bring this out as a pitch? And we did. So sold it to cartoon network and, you know, we made a first season and we're in the process Ooh. of making, well, I don't know what I'm allowed to say, but sure. we at least made the first season. That's Wink, so cool. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, though. Yeah, I think it's really good. It's really funny. And the vo- the main voice cast are all people who just work at the studio, like Parker does. Amazing. The main voice and one of the other storyboard artists does another voice. And, and my former assistant does uh, does another voice. So it's, Dude. it's, it's <laughs> yeah, you're a little, like, incubator. Yeah. I do the voice of a dog. Oh, it. perfect. Cool. What more do you yeah. need? Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. But not even a dog that speaks English. Just I just no. make barking. That'd sounds. be too easy. That'd be too easy. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta get it. You gotta bring it down a couple pegs. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Bark. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. What is there? So then, is there something that like? What do you look for in an animator when you want to like bring somebody on and be like, hmm. what are some things or, or advice? Well, depends on the job, but an animator specifically. Mm-hmm. There's, 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 there's an interesting thing. And I don't know if this is something that I came up with or I might've just coined it as a, as a catchphrase, but um, there are two things that in an art school or any kind of classical art training that exists, right? Two things are are your hand and your eye, right? You want to develop your eye to like see and -hmm. interpret, but your hand to be like the the technical instrument of then translating what you see onto a screen or onto a piece of paper or whatever. Sure. But since anim- animation is in motion, right? It happens on a timeline. There's a third aspect of something that I look for that I call the clock, right? Oh. So they need to have a hand and eye and a clock and the clock is about their timing and trying to pull off like jokes or acting or things like that. And you, it's not enough to be able to draw the drawings, you know, need to know where to put them to, to sell whatever you're trying to sell. If you're trying to make somebody cry or make somebody laugh or make somebody cheer or whatever, that clock is, is just as important as the other two. Ooh. Bam, answered your question. Ooh, look at that. <laughs> Look, that's the greatest answer I could have imagined. I just, I just asked thinking you weren't going to be able to do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, dude, we've been talking for over an hour already. This was so fun. Man. Uh, I, very quickly. Yeah, I know. This is, a, this is a, so we just, it, so the topic is just anybody you think yeah. you want to interview. Anyone, that's great. It's, it's that's not even an interview. It's literally anyone yeah. I find interesting. I just want to hang out with them for an hour and get to know them as a person. All right. 
Boom. That's a good premise. Thank I you. I like that premise. I appreciate that. I appreciate that a lot. Been at it for five years. Mm-mm-mm. So, well, before, hey, you're lucky you're a business. I got to say, you know, you're, you're, you're also interesting. You should yes. interview yourself in yeah, one of these things. No, I legally can't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> before I let you go, uh, where yeah. can people find you online? Oh, well, I guess the uh, well, there's, there's uh, tipmouse.net. The .net is the hard part. Mm-hmm. To remember, because we can't afford .com is a real story <laughs> because the guy's had it since 1997 and he wants an exorbitant amount of money for it. And, and oh. there's Google. Anybody, we're the first result on Google. That's fine. Yeah, that's, that's right. People. I hate that Do guy. It. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, so tipmouse.net. And then I guess on Twitter, maybe it, Chris Prynoski. That's it oh. at Twitter. One word, Chris Prynoski. C-H-R-I-S-P-R-Y-N-O-S-K-I. Yeah, I love it. Those are things. Boom. You can do. I love it. <laughs> and... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. That's balance with two L's. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps. Let them know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. Also, I made a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show and get access to other exclusive shows about a bunch of random things, you can now do that at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Logan, Victor, JC, and Christina. Your support means so much to me, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.